Good morning. Good morning. The people and pastor of the Lakeside United Methodist Church welcome you in worship, and we thank you for sharing your worship time with us. And also a special greeting to those watching our service on the television this morning. Um, our flowers on the altar this morning are given by Nancy Hagens in memory of her husband, Richard Hagens. And we're always glad to see young children in the church because they are such a blessing. We do offer child care, however, for those under age five on the first floor in the Northwest Wing. And then after the word with young disciples, ages six through 12, may worship with their teacher in the upper Northwest Wing where your parents can pick you up after the service. And then I think um, Pastor Vern had some announcements to make. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> You'll see uh, uh, after the offering, there is an affirmation of faith, and uh, we have it parsed so that there are voices from the South, voices from the North, voices from the choir. You are the South, okay? So in that litany where it says South, speak up. You are the North. And Virginia will lead the South, and I'll lead the North, and the South shall not rise again. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, you will also notice that in the act of praise in the opening of the liturgy, there is at least one word I've noticed that's incorrect. Uh, the last line of the act of praise, Spirit of God, teach us Christ's way of love. So you'll want that for your... Um, response. You will also see in the announcements an opportunity for Lenten study, uh, right, reading the gospel, also reading about the Wesleyan ways, the three rules. That opportunity is before you. I would, I would be blessed to hear from you and your interest in that. Thank you. You have uh, um, announcements of meetings and so forth on the back of your bulletin, but you, some of you who uh, came in the door received an invitation to uh, a special that United Methodist Women are doing on February 22nd at 7 p.m. in the parlor. I hope you will all come. Also, the welcome card you have, um, you can fill that out, one per family, and then put it in the offering plate when uh, they take up the offering. <clears throat> Lord, open our lips and we shall declare your praise.
Let us pray. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. In transfiguration, enlighten our path, that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity, and so share in the everlasting glory of him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. The people say, Amen. Amen. Our hymn, How Great Thou Art, 77. Let us sing.
please be seated. Join me in the act of praise. The Lord is one and eternal. God spoke from the mountain and said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord. You shall remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder, commit adultery, and steal. You neither shall bear false witness nor covet anything. Spirit of God, teach us Christ's way of love, mercy, and charity. Our hymn, 185, When Morning Gilds the Skies. And in praise of God and in love of one another, we offer prayers for the world, for the church, for people near to us, those far away. Keeping constant in our prayers the persons of our congregations and those dear to us, which you find in your prayer intentions, we also would lift the names of persons or events of lives that you would bring to the congregation today to echo your prayerful request. So, are there prayer requests, intentions? In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, hear the prayers of your people. Grant them peace in this life 
and in life to come. In transfiguration, enlighten our paths that we may devote this day and all the moments of our lives without fear to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers for the people of this assembly and for those dear to us near and far. Hear our prayers for the Lakeside Church in mission and ministry, for the people of the community and Lakeside Chautauqua, for the Marblehead Peninsula and island people and all those anywhere whose thought, whose praise, whose question, whose wonder, whose seeking is in your name this day. Hear our prayer for forgiveness that when we or any have ignored you or forgotten you, have failed to hear or to share the gospel of good news of Jesus Christ, that we may renew, transform, and revive in your love. For those who are traveling, and making any transition in this temporal world, for those making changes in their lives in response to the weather of the season, for those who are hither, thither, and yon, for those who are close by, and for those changes that we would make in heart, soul, and mind, that we might honor the image and likeness of Christ in others, hear our prayer. and for health and happiness enough that we might always love and serve you and one another in the common good. This we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you.
young people of the church will come and join us here in this level of the chancel. We have a word from the gospel for you. Come up here so we can be together and folks can see you and, and uh, Pam has a word for you. Come on, come on, there you go. I won't bite, I promise. <laughs> Good it's morning. It's good to see you guys. You know, I woke up this morning, and I listened out my window, and there was a cardinal singing. Except for looking at the snow, I thought it might be spring, but we know we got a little ways to wait. <clears throat> anyway, can you guys tell me what special holiday we're going to be celebrating this week? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, that's right. And what do we think of when we think of Valentine's Day? Family and friends. Love. Love. Do we think about candy? How about flowers? And no, I didn't take it from the bouquet. <laughs> what else? Cards. Are you guys having parties at school? Do you have a party coming up? No, some of you do, some of you don't. Um, are you making Valentine's, Emma? Do you make one for everybody in your class? Even somebody that maybe isn't very nice to you, you still make a valentine for them. Okay, and there's many kinds of valentines, aren't there? Some have candy attached to them, some have gum, some have toys, some valentines are funny, some are serious, and some have a message of friendship. Most valentines, though, have something on them. Can you tell me what that would be? And somebody has them on their shirt. Hearts, that's right, because what does a heart do? It represents love. Valentine's, Day, Valentine's are a nice way to say, I love you. But God doesn't send us Valentine's, does he? We don't get a Valentine in the mail from God. But, you know, there is something else that always reminds us of God's great love. And there's a symbol in the sanctuary that represents that. Can you look around and tell me what it might be there? The cross, very good. It's the cross. The cross is a symbol or a reminder that Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to suffer and die for us. So wherever you see a cross, it should be a reminder that Jesus loves us very, very much. He suffered and died on the cross, which might make us sad. However, the good news is that he rose again and he is alive. If you ever are tempted to doubt how much God the Father and Jesus love you, look at the cross. It reminds us that we are deeply loved and very precious to God. Do you think God wants a valentine from us? I think he does, but I don't think he wants just a paper valentine. It would be kind of hard to send it to him, wouldn't it? I think he wants us to show our love for him by giving our hearts to him. After all, he gave us his son. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that when we give Valentine cards to our family and friends, they would know that we really do care about them and love them. We also thank you so much for sending Jesus to save us. Whenever we see a cross, help us to remember your great love, and may we show our love to you by giving our hearts to you. Amen. Okay. I know it's his favorite candy. <laughs> You're welcome to uh, join uh, the Children's Church folks in the Upper Northwest Wing and enjoy your time there. And uh, Jonathan, if that candy's too much for you to carry, you could leave it here. <laughs> no, guess not. All right. Let us prepare our hearts and minds uh, for the reading of the word. Virginia. Our reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35, from the Message Bible. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, carrying the two tablets of the covenant, he didn't know that the skin of his face glowed because he had been speaking with God. 
Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, saw his radiant face, and held back, afraid to get close to him. Moses called out to them. Aaron and the leaders in the community came back, and Moses talked with them. Later, all the Israelites came up to him, and he passed on the commands, everything that God had told him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But when he went into the presence of God to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. When he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they would see Moses' face, his skin glowing, and then Moses would again put the veil on his face until he went back to speak with God. Our gospel song, Holy Ground, in the faith we sing, On this Transfiguration Sunday, we hear from the Gospel of Luke in the ninth chapter. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days, told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, send your spirit that we are hearers and doers of your word. The people say, Amen. Be seated. <clears throat> Last week, the gospel took us to the edge of a cliff. This week, we go up a mountain. Where next? Jesus leads his disciples up a mountain. He was forever making them go places with him that nobody much wanted to go. But this was different. Mountains are good, quiet, restorative places for Sabbath, retreat, rest, and renewal. Their pace had been hectic. So they headed for the hills. I know a man who does this. 
He goes to the Alaskan mountains two weeks every year to be alone, to find himself. Does Jesus take the followers up the mountain for a self-awareness retreat? On the mountain, everything changes. If Peter hoped to find self and rest, then forget that. The disciples' solitude is intruded upon by the dead. He is discovered by the two great figures of his faith, Moses and Elijah, with Jesus. Stunning, transfiguring, and inspiring speech follows. Peter, jolted awake, listens in on the conversation between Jesus and the patriarchs. And Peter blurts out, let's stay here forever. Who actually is transfigured? Is Jesus all bright and shiny? Or are Peter and others and us today, are we the transfigured? In the mystery of grace and transfiguration, rather than Jesus changed, suppose we are changed. And we may see him and people as we truly are. Maybe we are transfigured so that we can see reality as it really is. In life, and in the sight of the Holy One. Yes, the gospel lets us know the difference between the ways that we look at the world, distinct from its reality in the sight of the Holy One. And so it is that we sing, Be Thou My Vision. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my light. The gospel speaks to us of the difference between the ways we look at the world and the reality of life as it is in the sight of the Holy One. Is this a real distinction? Is it possible for us to live with this sight? Recall, recall the Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania tragedy when a gunman took hostage Amish children in a schoolhouse. Innocents were killed and others were scarred forever. And yet, immediately, in that same day, leaders of that Amish community went to the widow of the shooter to offer her grace, to offer her mercy, to offer her support. Even one Amish man holding in his arms for over an hour the father of the one who wreaked havoc in the community. The Amish also created a charitable fund for that family the family of the shooter. Can we see it? The distinction? Jesus takes them down from the mountain, and then he takes them toward Jerusalem on the mission that in the future would change faith community forever. Neither they nor we are eager about coming down from the mountain and moving into the way of mission. Can we see it? Can we go there? 
A few weeks ago, I had a bad day, a culmination of a bad week. The sermon didn't go quite that well. My pastoral care had been misinterpreted. Some folks continued to grind the gossip wheel of an untrue claim. I was on the verge of a cliff that I might have fallen into. A cliff of seeing us only through the lens of all that trouble. But then, another change. A transforming moment. Reading a text I had worked on many times before, in the second of Galatians, I noticed something, a little word, a little Greek word, E-I-S, we transliterate it. Paul says in Galatians, a person is righteous not by works, but through faith in Jesus Christ. But E-I-S is translated either in or of. Is it faith in Jesus Christ? Is Jesus the object of our faith? And with enough believing, then he can do things for us? Or can it also be the faith of Jesus Christ? That we are to live with the same faith, the same suffering, obedient unto death, a boldly trusting faithfulness, the same as Jesus. Suddenly, that latter possibility glowed before me. It lit up my imagination, it transfigured my previous understandings, changed the way I see. Our being right with God is not so much our belief in Christ as it is our believing and doing like Jesus. What matters is Jesus. Our moving toward the world as he moved. Living, believing, and doing as Jesus. Recall Mother Teresa's well-known words. When asked, what can we possibly do in the face of this overwhelming human suffering? And she answered, be Jesus to them. I wanted to preserve that moment, but I couldn't. I had to go on and be pastor answer the mail, prepare the meeting agendas, visit, construct a sermon, do the things, sweep the salt off the carpet. And yet I could go on and do those things with the insight that comes in transfiguration, living with the faith of Jesus, not seeing the world from the cliff, but moving away from the mountain, seeing people as we truly are, in light and in sight of the Holy One. Can we see it? Can we go there? Can we learn from the example of the Amish community in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania? And so it is that we shall sing, Heart of my own heart, whatever be befall, still be my vision, ruler of all. This Transfiguration Sunday, are our eyes opened today? Are we prepared to come down from this mountain worship and move into the way of mission? Can we see it? Can we go there? Moving into a Christian Lent and Easter, we sing, I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Let us pray.
Gracious God, open our eyes that we may see visions of truth you have for us to see. Through Christ we pray, the people say, Amen. Friends, our hymn 451, Be Thou My Vision. Friends in Christ, let us offer ourselves and gifts in service of Christ's church.
Gracious God, bless, refine, preserve, and extend these gifts and these people for the sake that your good news is preached and heard, for the common good of all the people that you would love. Through Christ we pray, the people say, Amen. Amen. And friends, I invite us to turn to this affirmation of faith printed in our order for worship. Virginia will lead the south and I the north, and you will see the other responses indicated. This is a, an affirmation written by Carolyn Jeanette, Gillette, a noted hymnist and person of faith in our world today. Virginia? Oh Lord, as you were on your way to where you'd one day die, you wanted time to rest and pray, to hear God's word to you that day. Your face shone bright beyond compare, just like a glimpse of heaven there. Your clothes were dazzling white, your glory came to light. The law of the prophets guided you as you discerned God's will. With Moses and Elijah too, you spoke of God's great plan for you, God's promise to fulfill one Friday on a hill. Why could you not remain with them and there Say. This is my own dear son. Now listen to him, everyone. And so you turn to say, you'd go the harder way. Oh, oh Lord, Lord, how, how often, often we pursue success, success at any cost, and, and yet we hear God's, God's word anew, that, that we are called to follow you, who serve, serve the poor, the, the lost, and journey to, to the cross. cross. So it is we sing, Ask You What Great Thing I Know, the hymn 163. And may God raise you up on eagles' wings and bear you on the breath of dawn and make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of God's hand forever, the people say. Amen. Amen. Our son benediction. 